I wanna share three of my favorite unconventional use cases to get the most out of a teleprompter. It's been years since I last showed this on the channel, and there's been a bunch of new things that I've learned that helped me just level up even more, and there's been new excitement around teleprompters, so I thought I'd share some of my new improvements here in this video. You can follow the chapter markers and timestamps, of course, and these will all work with most models. I will in the second half be covering some of my considerations on the different teleprompters that are available and also cover some of my overall thoughts on a unit that I've been testing for the last year and it's going to be the demonstration model in this video, the ProLine Plus. A bunch of the time that I'm using my teleprompter, I'm not actually using it to be a teleprompter. There are three frequent use cases or hacks, if you will, that I wanted to share with you. The first being to use it to more confidently pitch clients on Zoom by having cheater notes up while you're actually talking into the camera on a Zoom call. So you can be referencing notes while having great eye contact. The second one being, and probably my personal favorite, is using it for leveling up your documentary interviews where you can set it up so the subject matter is looking directly into the lens. And then lastly, and the one that I use the most frequently, is to use it as a second monitor while you're live streaming or teaching and you wanna be able to reference the notes for your slides or you wanna see how much time you have left or you wanna see what your next slide is. This is a professional setup that I use for paid video work, but the tricks that I'm gonna share with you will work with whatever teleprompter is in your budget with just some, some caveats to work around. Let's jump into the first one that I'm excited to share and that's how I use this for interviews. So this is my basic interview setup for 90% of the interviews I do. Camera's here, I'm right off to the side, subject's looking at me. For some interview use cases, you might want to have the subject matter look directly down the lens. That creates a really unique, intimate look. It works great for personal stories. It works good for announcement videos. It works good for corporate videos where I'm telling you about the business. But the problem is if I have the subject matter look down the lens and I stay to the side, every time they answer their question, the eyes are gonna flick back to the person asking the question. It's just an impulse. It's really hard to get people to stop doing that. So instead of getting them to stop because they're probably nervous to be on camera already, what if I use something I already had and put a teleprompter in front and put a video feed of the interviewer's face so they have something to look at. So now you can conduct the interview from the side here. You can look directly at the webcam. You can reference notes of things that you wanna talk about coming up in the interview and it all looks like you're just still looking straight down the webcam. You can have a camera feed from your camera into the laptop so you can monitor your angle. So they feel like they're connecting directly with a person but they're actually looking directly into a lens. And so what this is really helpful for as an interviewer is empathizing with the person you're interviewing. So you get great eye contact, you can make them feel like they're being listened to, you can do affirmative listening, nodding your head. So this works well with a more intimate, serious interview, but it also works really well for corporate videos. And that's where oftentimes I end up using this the most, where uh, the owner of a business needs to talk down the lens to a camera, to a customer, and feel confident. This gives you a lot more options to edit around if you actually wanna show their face talking and their eyes aren't shifting all over the place when they're done saying sentences. Now, a couple considerations here. You can do this without a teleprompter at all. You can just stand directly by the <laughs> behind the camera and get your eyes kind of just poking above. That's one way that I've done this just quickly on the feed without a setup like this, if you're gonna be doing it outside in bright light, you're gonna need a really bright monitor. So if you're stuck with just an iPad or a monitor that isn't as bright, save this technique for inside where you can control the lighting a little bit more. A tip to level this up is take a camera feed and run it into your laptop so while you're looking at the webcam as the interviewer, you also get to check the framing and the angle of the actual shot you're capturing. Now, lots of cameras have USB-C outputs now, or you can just use any USB capture device to take the HDMI feed straight into your laptop. Now, if you just wanna completely level up this whole thing, you can do a remote interview this way. So if you're gonna be sending a production company out somewhere and you're not able to be there personally to interview, or you have an expert on a subject matter who's conducting an interview, you can have them do it from Zoom in their home, zoom into the laptop you have at production, put their face on the camera. So you're doing a remote interview set up the face of the person doing the interview is right here on the camera on location, yet they're thousands of miles away over Zoom into a camera feed. If you get creative, there's so many different ways you can use this to level up your productions. This next use case has really been catching on over the years and for good reason. It's probably the technique in this video that's made me the most money relative to how I use it. Having the teleprompter next to your computer and using it as a second monitor. So loading up your Zoom call directly onto the teleprompter, so that way when you're on the Zoom call, you're actually having great eye contact with the lens. For me, when I'm on a pitch meeting, 
I want to do my absolute best. And that means remembering the details of things that the clients previously told to me in our discovery calls, because I'm trying to present that I'm a great solution to the problem that they're trying to solve. And so remembering the exact details is actually really important and it shows that you care. And you did all this prep work ahead of time in being able to actually utilize that prep and not be nervous that you're forgetting numbers, because sometimes I'll just skip over the details if I'm not confident they're accurate because it's embarrassing to get details wrong. But if I have the details right there to reference as I'm on the call, it helps me just feel more at ease for what I already prepared for. And honestly, it just helps me do a lot better of a job when I'm pitching stuff, which is very helpful because when I pitch stuff, I make money and that's a win. The third way that I use the teleprompter builds off the last one, and that is continuing to use it as a second monitor. And when teaching webinars, I use this in two ways. The first way is when I actually have my slides up, I put the notes and the next slide information and the duration of the presentation all onto the teleprompter monitor. That way, when I'm actually saying my material and trying to stay on track, I'm looking directly down the lens, creating that good connection that we've been talking about through this video. This has really helped me elevate my online teaching, and I've used it for presentations that I've done for a certain fruit company. I also use it with Adventure Film Academy. That's where I teach people how to make videos. So this is a technique that's really been effective for me to just do a better job with virtual teaching. So this right here is a great example of the type of camera angle I like to do for live teaching, webinars, live streaming, Zoom calls, presentations, all of the above. I'm seeing messages from moderators. I can basically have a heads up display of any important critical information that I choose I want on screen in my field of view and still bringing great energy directly to the camera. I mean, I think it's kind of ironic that I use a teleprompter all the time. And the most common way I use it is not to have the text actually scroll like you would normally think of with the teleprompter. If you have any tips yourself, I would love to hear them down in the comments. And I also have a free email series of other filmmaking tips that we're kicking back up. So if you want some more fun tips like this about filmmaking, adventure filmmaking, that's a free resource I have just for you. I wanna do a lot more teaching, but let's talk about the actual teleprompters themselves. There's some important things that I wish that I had learned earlier that I didn't know would be important to me, but are important to me now. Uh, the difference in my headspace between uh, a hobby workflow or a more prosumer workflow versus a professional workflow that I actually need to use on sets. And of course, the model that I've been using throughout this video is a professional model, the ProLine Plus. Uh, I wanna talk about all the things that I've learned about that in the last year of testing. and. Uh, hopefully share with you some tidbits in your teleprompter journey. So my gateway into this world was a cheap Amazon teleprompter. I can't say I recommend this. Uh, it's basically cheap sheet metal. It's a couple steps above a DIY option, but not by much. You throw an iPad in there, no adjustment of any kind. It kind of just sits there. Using an iPad is a pro and a con. I'll kind of share some of, some of my thoughts on that. The main things that I didn't think I would run into is actually just the fabric itself. So you can get this set up and you can finesse it and you can put it in the right spot and get your camera sorted by adding your own quick release plate and all this stuff. But the fabric kept dipping down into the lens and then I tried to make my own DIY using clothes hanger to prop it up. But then I, the fabric is cheap enough that it actually has light bleed. So I was getting my film lights bleeding through the fabric, reflecting off the glass back. I was getting some really funky flares and it was, uh, you could make it work, but you had to put in a lot of effort. And then once it was set up, you absolutely could not move anything. Otherwise everything would fall apart and you'd have to do it all over again. So that's kind of the punchline of a lot of the really cheap setups. You can make them work, but you really have to finesse them and then don't change them. And honestly, as a hobbyist, as someone just getting into it or someone on a budget and you just want to experiment, go for it, go that route, it's fine, you can try it. But for me, I found immediately, I really enjoyed using it and I wanted more out of it. And then also in the professional side with my work, I realized, hey, I've used prompters on set in the past. I think I want to add one into my own kit so that way I can level up my production workflow. So that's where some more considerations come in. So with iPads and phones uh, on the clip-on, teleprompters. Positives are you might already have this, so you don't have to invest in a monitor. Uh, downside is you have, to, you have to have it in the teleprompter, so if you want to use it for other things or if you have a more permanent studio setup, you have to keep adding it back and then pulling it out. For me, the downsides I ran into was brightness. So I really wanted to be able to do more stuff outside and have brighter studio lights and still be able to see the display. But I know that my friend Jacques and Gerald Undone both use different versions of iPhone teleprompters clipped directly to the lens. And I think that might be a really effective solution for someone who doesn't want to do all the fancy stuff that I've been talking about in this video, but just using it for purely scrolling text for making a video. Uh, that might be a good option to look into. 
So as a consumer in the teleprompter space, you've got a lot of options in front of you. I would love to hear which ones you've been using down below if you've had great experiences with them because truthfully, I've only used a few limited ones. So my experience isn't super, super wide, super deep. Let's get to some of my thoughts on the professional model that I've been showing off throughout this video and that I've been testing through the last year. So there's three main benefits that became really obvious to me immediately. Uh, the first one being visibility. The second one being adjustability. The third being repeatability. Visibility. Uh, first thing here is just the fabric. I would not have expected this, but where the fabric meets the lens and then to the glass, the way that prompter people have done this on this plastic shell designed to give it support and it's nice and rigid and it's got reinforcements in it to keep it from sagging and it's really adjustable and the, the Velcro just comes off nice and it makes me not resent making changes to my lenses with this setup and it also doesn't bleed light in so you can actually see the teleprompter, which is kind of important. The glass, I noticed a massive improvement from my, my cheapo model, uh, specifically in color cast, so it's not shifting the colors of my cameras if I'm doing a multicam setup, it's, but there's no effort to match things. They use 65-35 glass on their full teleprompter range and that helps the actual display show up nice and crisp and bright and I can see details really well and it's all reflected beautifully to me here looking at it. And then of course, monitor. So they have something called the Tab Grabber, which is for tablets. It clamps on very securely to all different sizes of tablets, but I have been very happy with going a dedicated monitor route. This, especially for setups that are gonna stay set up for a long time or setups that you wanna use outside, having a monitor is really, really helpful. I'm using the high bright model, which is awesome. It's very bright. Uh, I dim it down when I'm in the studio because I don't need it to be that bright, but for exterior setups, this makes a big difference. So if you're going down that pathway where you want to do exterior setups, I highly recommend over an iPad getting something bright. That just makes a really big difference and you want people outside to be able to see what the prompter actually says. If you're not going that route, maybe you don't need to go the full high bright option. There's, there's a range of different stuff that you can look at, but especially if you're going to be using the teleprompter as a second monitor for your computer. For me, I want that to be bigger. So that's where I struggled with, with some of the other smaller things on the market in that seven. I wanna have enough resolution that I can actually read text. I can see things scrolling by in chat and I can actually use it as a proper second monitor. You can power this monitor in the field as well with V mounts with a D-tap to XLR cable and that's very helpful. Second big thing I noticed is the adjustability. So being able to change it from your different various camera setups, being able to modify angles, adjust things, slide things up and down, all of that is just easier with something that's better built. Especially when compared to the flimsy early model that I had, uh, which basically had zero adjustability, being able to adjust and move things from cinema builds down to mirrorless cameras through all different production workflows is, is easy. It's very nice. And then the third thing builds off the adjustability, but repeatability, uh, being able to break it down and set it up again and set it up the same way over and over again in multiple locations in your home studio, wherever you're going to use it and be able to have it actually work without being able to, without needing to be super finicky. That's where I think the, the better models really set themselves apart, especially the ProLine Plus that I've been using. It's just easier to set up and tear down quickly. Anybody who's done work with teleprompters, it's extra steps. It's more things in front of the lens. And if it's difficult to use, you're going to try to find ways not to use it. So that uh, closes off my main section on talking about the ProLine Plus that I've been testing out and just some of the, the things that I've noticed. If you have other questions, I can try to answer them. But as far as your journey into finding something that will work for you, I think I would say try out a teleprompter, especially if you're curious, it's a lot of fun to work it into your, into your workflow and you can get creative with it and it can bring a lot of value and it's fun. And as far as which one you get, I don't care. <laughs> I wanted you to know some of the things that I've learned, especially as I move from production workflows to at home studio workflows and everything in between. But as you assess what kind of value you're going to get out of it, you can hopefully make some decisions that will best serve you in that pursuit. That's going to be it for this video. Thanks so much for watching. Remember, Life's better when you make stuff. Peace.